morning, everyone. And I have a small request. Uh, I'm going to give you some, uh, you know, work for your hands. Please cooperate. Let me start. I'm going to be a bit provocative as I start this conversation. First thing is, how many of you believe, raise your hands, that transformation in industry, in history, politics, are all happened through some form of intelligence over the history? That's a fair amount in the audience. Yes, transformation has always happened through intelligence. Now let's just question intelligence from the context of business. First one, I want to ask you, if you're running a business or you're part of a business, how many of you have 100% market share of your business? Can anybody raise your hand? Anybody in this audience with 100% market share, okay? Anybody with 50% market share of your market? No. Anybody with 50% market share? I really want to acknowledge you. Very few industries in the world have 40% market share. Very few. So you're operating in some very unique spaces. Largest retailer in the world has, as I read very recently, has 38% market share. Trillion dollar company has only 37% market share. Now the, the reason I want to share with you is if you own only a fraction of the market share, and many market leaders have few single-digit market share percentage, where does the intelligence lie, with you or outside you? The intelligence lies outside your company because your data is only a fraction of the market. So let's start with saying that the intelligence is sitting outside the market. Let me start with another provocation here. How many of you think AI is a good enabler in these times? In other words, AI is relevant. I'm going to be provocative again here. AI, I'm going to make a statement. AI is completely irrelevant unless the data that you use for AI is relevant. Point number three. What do you think is the biggest cost of any business? Anybody in the audience? Just voice out. Sorry? Manpower. Marketing. Great. Anything else? Biggest cost? Customer acquisition. Fantastic. So I'm going to make a statement here. You can see for your own business. Maybe you're all true in your own context, but this is mostly true and it is non-intuitive, which is the biggest cost of any business is making wrong products. Think about it. The biggest cost of any business is making something customers don't want. What are you going to invest behind those products? Everything you said. All the people, all the technology, everything, marketing, everything is going behind something which customers don't want. Now the question here is, how many of technology solutions we see in the market which is talking about making the right products? Most of the solutions that we are after today is all about how do I get to the right customer? Personalization. Let's do this. Let's convert that moment. Everything in the last mile. Our biggest mistake is always made when you decide to make what to provide to the consumer. With all of that, let me just, you know, let me just start with a very quick introduction. Is the clicker working? Can you put the presentation, please? I can't see it on the screen. I can see it here. Yes, up. These brands can see something that others haven't yet. Because they're powered by game-changing intelligence that enables transformative decision-making. This industry-agnostic technology uses predictive analytics to help you see what's ahead. 
It keeps your finger on the pulse of consumer demand. Like magic, transforming your business. So, how does the magic happen? Demand signs for always-on, real-time consumer intelligence. AI native approach, predictive intelligence. Adoption-friendly, faster time to market. The magic of game-changing intelligence. Stylumia. I think they've been listening to the previous panel and they were talking about T20, T10, uh, you know, five-day matches. What is the game that we are talking about? All the game that we are playing is to engage with the consumer as a business. We have something to offer to the consumer and that's the game that we are talking about. And I'm also going to give you a promise. Of course, this is a, I think I have 11 minutes left. I'm going to give a bonus through this presentation and the bonus is towards the end of this presentation. In fact, it could be better than what you, so you're going to see through the next 10 months. What is the challenge? The challenge is today, most of the businesses, this is not just saying, and it's also Gartner's uh, research, most of the businesses are looking at saying that, okay, I have this product I have to take to the consumer, which is an approach of category, taking a category to consumers. The future is putting consumer at the center. Easier said than done. It's not just putting consumer at the center in one part of the organization, the entire organization focusing on the consumer. Right from product development, design, creation, right up to fulfillment and post-sale. Now, how does one do that? Now, it all, as I told you, it all starts with intelligence. A lot of people say that I have a lot of data, I have, you know, I'm taking these days data-driven decision-making. And I was telling you that uh, having data doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's good. Your data need to be relevant. A lot of people today go after data. One is, of course, your data is multiplying. That's, uh, your data is very contextual. You know exactly what your demand is. And we now know that most of intelligence is outside your organization. How do you acquire that data? And one way people acquire this data is through scraping other companies, competitors, etc. But that data is very easy. It's very trivial. With Gen AI, collecting data is going to be super simple. Maybe users can themselves collect data. Now the point is the data you collect from internet is supply-driven data. It only tells you what others have. It has a lot of noise. Just to give you perspective, of course we started working with fashion across all categories, including spirit, FMCG and all. Now the question here is, take a category like fashion, one out of two products don't sell well. Which means if you collect supply-driven data, it's 50% noise. Now, data alone doesn't help. Therefore, one needs to move from supply-driven to a demand-driven intelligence. So how do you, uh, you know, find out demand of products in the market of others, not yours? Now, that's a non-trivial problem, and that's something that uh, we attempted to solve. Now, the way that we do that is we look at various solutions in the market. Now, the way we do that is we collect data at internet scale. Just to give you the magnitude of data we collect, we collect 500 million impressions every week. And we, sit, we are currently sitting with 17 billion data impressions. Now, what is our data size? We are a super set of the Amazons and the Walmarts, the Macy's, the Unilevers, and you can take any category for that matter, right? So that's our data set, and it's exponentially growing. Now, this data collection is trivial, as I told you. Now, what do we do with that data? So not only we collect the data, we look at surrogate demand signals for every single product on a daily basis. And that could be many. And these are non-linear signals, right? It can vary from intensity of consumer visibility for every single product related to others across different markets at geo-local level. And all of them go through our proprietary neural network whose job is to predict demand of every single product without knowing demand. So we are trying to decode something which is not a public data. So we're converting the entire public data into a private data, and which, is, which removes a lot of noise and gives you a fair amount of signal, which I call relevant data. Now with that, what can you do? Now with that, you can do lots of stuff. One is understand market intelligence. Now, when I say market, in, it's not market information. It is market intelligence. What in the market consumers prefer? 
their dynamic taste and preferences over time. Number two, shopper insights. There are a lot of consumer research companies who are there who go and ask, what do you like? Will you like this new product? Now, it, we are not asking customers. We are observing what customers are doing on a dynamic basis over time, which means we understand taste and preferences of shoppers across time and what they're doing. And the last one is competitive intelligence. Dynamic competitive intelligence of what's working for your competition in your markets at geolocal level across the world. Now, we have seen a lot of competitive intelligence, price mapping, price matching, understanding products, etc. But what we see today is, what we do is supply-based matching. Now, supply-based matching will help you take lots of comparative decisions, but not based on consumer demand. Imagine you have two products where one product of your competition, consumer demand intensity is very high, and you are lower priced, or you are higher priced, you will take a strategic decision to not only price match, even go lower on price to gain walk-ins into that product. Now, you might ask a question, have you guys validated your demand sensing engine? These are some of our customers. As you can see, we get our demand accuracy 80% plus. This is across categories across the world. Now, how, how does it help you as a brand or a retailer or a manufacturer? We can help you give dynamic white space opportunities. Now, that's what you want. You don't want information. You want intelligence which is not even predictive. It is even prescriptive. These are the white spaces that you should enter. Customers are preferring. You don't have. You have less of start doing. For various ways that we can recommend, start doing these items. Market demand intensity is high, you have, you're not doing at all, why not you go ahead and do it? And we do this at zillions of combinations of attributes using both image and text analysis along with our demand sensing. Recommendations could be do more. We not only tell you what to start doing, we also tell you what to exit. Please exit these, you will kill your money, you are putting money in the wrong place. And these are black spaces, right? While you have white spaces, we also come back and tell you what are the black spaces. So far we have seen, okay, what items to make, all that is fine. How many of you here, you got the right product, but you're stuck with a lot more quantity of inventory? The product seems to be right, right? Now, many a times, we are stuck with product, we got the wrong product, we actually made the wrong quantity. For predicting demand of new products is another big challenge. For we built a demand predictor where you can actually upload your new product. Of course, it's trained on all the data that you have, which is all your relevant market contextually mapped for you. And the engine can actually tell you what is the predicted demand of this new product. Good, bad, ugly, even before you made one product. For two ways you can de-risk, get the right products and also get the right quantity. One of time, I'm just skipping that uh, demo where it can also give you design change requests. Not only tell you that how it will perform, it can also tell you change this attribute, the potential of this product performing is better. Okay, move. Just to give you very quick case studies on how various brands and retailers are benefiting across different categories. Fundamentally, we impact three key variables. We improve demand velocity, which is revenue. Because you're making the right product, your demand velocity is going up, you're also pricing it correct, doing the right promotions. And the second one is we also reduce the inventory because if you sell well, you're left with less inventory, less working capital. Last one is you're discounting less because you're not stuck with so much, right? Hence, you're getting lift in profitability for three key p &L variables. Various brands, 100 plus brands across different parts of the world. I just want to share, sometimes we all show big names. We work with companies which is as low as 10 crores turnover to Fortune 100 retailer. For we want to democratize intelligence. We also work, we believe in partnership, and uh, we also work with knowledge, uh, you know, research uh, institutes like MIT and Wharton, just to, just to name a few. In case you would like to reach me, uh, you know, you can scan this barcode. I'll just leave it for 30 seconds. I hope, uh, I hope you liked what you saw, but I just want to leave you with, uh, you know, one message. Okay, before anyway, I'm, I'm going to be outside and we'll share with you. Sorry for that. Uh, 
what is very important is keep consumer at the center, just not focusing on data, but relevant data, and get intelligence outside the organization, just not within the organization, and ensure that you are creating a lot of uh, footprints, right? At this point of time, you might be thinking that, uh, Ganesh, you told me, you told us that you're going to give a bonus, right? I don't know if I made a great presentation, right? Are there anybody here, uh, you know, uh, who would like to clap? I just want to share, the insight that I want to share with you is, I actually triggered a clap. If you observe what you did, right, each one of you are thinking, should I be the first person to clap? How many of you are thinking like that? Should I be the first person to clap? And you started clapping after somebody, you started hearing some clap. How many of you clapped after you started hearing the first clap? Fair amount? Now, I just want to share one research insight. Right. What you saw today is, uh, is a research called social contagion, like epidemic. Right? Epidemic spreads. Like that, our claps also spread. And uh, typically, and the research has proved that the second, third clap starts after the first clap. Right? The, all movements start with that. Right? So very important for you to ensure that you create the first clap, and the, which clap I'm talking about, not the clap for my presentation, the clap for your products. Very important, because you want to increase the intensity of traffic for each one of your products. So you need to create the first clap, and that first clap will happen for, by making the right product in first place. Number two, when does the clap stop? The clap stops when the first person nearby you stops. The research has proven that. Now, why am I saying that? All products has its own timeline in terms of how long it will survive. So it's very, very important that you keep the energy of your products continuously alive. The only way you can do that is keep launching new products, keep energizing existing products by constantly looking at what's happening around in the market so that you have a collective intelligence behind everything that you do. Hope that's worth a bonus. Thank you very much. Again, I just want to share with you, this clap is a genuine clap. Thank this you. is the organic clap. The first one is an inorganic clap. I think the life is a combination of organic. Thank you very much.